Good morning again. Good to see your smiling faces. Really good. You know, there's something interesting about the COVID time in our society. And for a long time, our church families were unable to meet. And then uh, they could meet under conditions. And I've discovered that there are quite a number of Christians, including Seventh-day Adventists, who have decided that it's convenient to stay home and listen to a preacher online. But um, it's great to see you here today. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it's my custom to welcome visitors, at least those I know about. And uh, I know that we have with us Richard Blair from Yucca, Arizona. Are you here somewhere, Richard? Glad to have you today. Really delighted to see you here. And uh, is it Delisa Crab Kaiser? Yes. Welcome as well to you. And then we have some people from Lincoln City and... Oh, I hope I can pronounce it, Arenko. Arenko. And uh, that's Erling Oxenholt, Robert Bird, Burden, Burdan, Burdan, and Ellen Nona Hoyven. And we're delighted to have you here, too. And I don't know, there might be uh, another face or two that uh, considers yourself a visitor. And if I didn't welcome you personally by name, my apologies. You introduce yourself to me after the service. I'd love to get to know you. Somewhere beyond the grave, there is a land which Jesus went to prepare by his own hand. And for the saved by grace, there is a resting place. And in a few more days, it will be mine. Some call it heaven. I call it home. Some call it dreaming. <laughs> well, let me dream on. Some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the skies. Yes, some call it heaven, but I call it home. Words written to a gospel song by Squire Parsons a number of years ago. And they got me thinking, thinking about home our heavenly home. The famous explorer Marco Polo, after completing his journeys, went back to Venice, his home. And when he got back, he began to describe. He began to describe some of the things he had seen. But his close friends thought he had gone mad. He told them about black stones that you could actually set on fire and they would provide heat for you. But his friends couldn't imagine such a thing. They had never heard of charcoal. He told them about a piece of cloth that refused to catch fire no matter how hard he tried. But they couldn't imagine what he was talking about. They had never heard of asbestos. He told them about large animals, almost 20 feet long, 18, 17, big. They had jaws large enough to swallow a grown man. But his friends couldn't imagine what he was talking about. They had never seen a crocodile. 
And then, <laughs> and then he told them about a substance that came spewing and bubbling out of the ground. And when lit, it would catch on fire and actually provide light. But they couldn't imagine it because they had never heard of crude oil. Years later, years later, Marco Polo was lying on his deathbed. And one of the few men who actually believed him visited and said, Marco, tell me all those stories again. I want to hear them again. But Marco Polo refused and simply said, just know that it's all true. Every bit of what I told you. And in fact, I have not told you half of what I saw. That story reminded me of a passage in John 22, 24, and 25. John's concluding his gospel there, and he says, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. <laughs> I liked his use of kind of a collective pronoun there. He writes it and he says, we, meaning somebody else besides himself, knew these things were very true. And that passage reminds me in turn of what John says in Revelation 21 concerning a new heaven, a new earth, and a new holy city. In verses 1 and 2, John says, I saw. Then I, John, saw. In other words, make no mistake. What I'm about to tell you is as real as it comes. I may have seen it in vision. I may have seen it visited by the Lord or by an angel. But it's real. Count on it. Those of you who have been listening in your small group gatherings to presentations by David Asherick will recall that he describes the books at the end of Revelation and the books at the beginning of Genesis as bookends. Bookends. And the first two chapters talk about Eden. And the last two chapters in the Bible talk about Eden restored. In his lectures, he is talking about the war between Christ and Satan. He's talking about chapter 3 in Genesis. And he's talking about the 20th chapter of Revelation. But today, I wish to spend just a few minutes considering these bookends which describe the first Eden created and lost and Eden restored. In a time when numerous signs point to Christ's imminent return and our tendency, if we're not fully committed to Christ, is to perhaps feel uncertainty or fear about how the war ends in our personal lives. I believe it's worth our time to revisit what Scripture has to say about what it was in the beginning and what it will be in the future. You see... Human history began in paradise, the Garden of Eden. 
It was home. And to the extent that history is defined by time, it will end in paradise, the new Jerusalem, the new earth, Eden restored, home. Revelation 21, verse 5, sums up the last two chapters of the book. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. What began in Genesis is finally brought to completion in Revelation. The notion of Eden restored does not, however, suggest there are no differences. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I would like to share a little chart. And I don't know if you can read the small print. But I pulled this together. There are many more that could have been added. But if you look down at it, the first Eden lost. The sun and moon, for example, were created. Revelation, Eden restored, talks about what? No sun and moon. So where do they get their light? Yes. The Lamb is the light. The seas, that's going to be different. If you're a deep sea diver who loves those sea animals, I believe the Lord will have something for you. <laughs> but it apparently won't be seas quite like we know them. And then in Genesis 3, a curse was announced. And there is no more curse once Eden is restored. You get the idea. In Genesis 3, death became our lot as humans. In Eden restored, what? No more death. No more death. The journey to full restoration begins in heaven. It's a subject that has prompted scores of hymns and gospel songs, and we've sung and listened to a few today. So what can we know about heaven from an examination of Scripture? Well, I would suggest there are some broad categories of what we can know. And first of those, heaven is a very real place. Many people deny heaven's existence. They say it's a state of mind. It's wishful thinking. Or it's a pleasant but frivolous dream. But Jesus said what? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to what? Prepare a place. Heaven is real. There's a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am... Again, a place, there you may be also. The emphasis is on what John saw. He said in verse 1 of Revelation 21, I saw a what? New heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there's that little bit, no more sea. Then I, John, saw what? The holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven. Certainly, certainly, heaven is a place. In other words, heaven is as real as Central Oregon is. Although vast expanses of juniper and sagebrush may be lacking. <laughs> Secondly, heaven is a place ready for occupancy. John saw the holy city as what? Notice that last phrase, prepared as a what? Bride adorned for her husband. I'm sure you have attended a lot of weddings. And if so, you know firsthand that it takes a bride a long time to get ready. Hours and hours in some cases, what with the dress and the hair and the makeup and whatever else goes on. Well, our Lord has spent a lot of time. He's sparing no expense in readying heaven for us. And I find it interesting that he's had a couple thousand years to do it this time. When he prepared the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve, he seemed to pull it off in six days. There's still some great beauty on this earth, wouldn't you agree? Even though our earth has been cursed all these years. The butterfly, the sculpted rose, the stars, the planets. In comparison to heaven, and I love to visit the national parks, but in comparison to heaven, the Grand Canyon or the Tetons, or whatever other place you want to name, <laughs> will appear to be really nothing more than an infected wound. R.G. Lee has said, Heaven is the most marvelous place the wisdom of God could conceive and the power of God could prepare. Amen. That reminds me of a story told by Pastor Jerry Shirley about a little girl who was born blind. The only beauty she knew came from her mother's description of the flowers in spring, the trees in fall, snow in winter, and the ocean in summertime. A number of years ago, my wife and I had opportunity to drive what is called the Hall Road in Alaska, clear up to Prudhoe Bay. And we happened to hit fall in the tundra. It's almost indescribable. The colors are spectacular. And I've lived in New England, and I've watched those beautiful leaves on the trees falling to the ground. But the tundra has more color. The sad part is it only lasts three or four days, so you have to hit it just right. But spectacular color. It would be very difficult to describe. But this mother had done her best to describe the beauties out there. And at 10 years of age, the little girl had experimental surgery to see if they could help her see. When the bandages were removed several weeks later, the moment of truth came. She ran to the window and stood breathless looking outside. Mother, why didn't you tell me it was so beautiful, she asked. I tried, Mom replied, 
but words just wouldn't suffice. And I believe in heaven, in the not too distant future, we're going to run around rather breathlessly. And when we see the Apostle John, we're going to say, John, why didn't you tell us? And he'll say, I tried, but words just didn't suffice. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It's okay. Just keep dreaming about what heaven is like. Number three, heaven is a revitalizing and refreshing place. Have you ever been really thirsty? Like I am right now? <laughs> it's pretty dry. I, I think, anyway, um, sorry about that. I shouldn't have taken a detour. I took the kids back in the day when I could hike. I took the kids many years ago, our daughter and son, up into the Wallawas. And uh, we uh, actually went up into the Eagle Cap Wilderness. And we climbed a zigzag trail up from a campground, hundreds of feet to the top, and got to a beautiful little lake. And um, we had forgotten the mosquito repellent. And thank you very much. We had forgotten the mosquito repellent. And my son was swatting his head, his arms, his legs. Swatting. Just, that's all he could do. And I said, Jeffrey, did you notice how pretty it is here? He said, no. Those dumb mosquitoes. And he took off down the mountain, down the trail, a lot faster than dad could move. I didn't see him again until he got back to camp. But then, then I decided we would drive home and we were living in Walla Walla, so it was a little bit of a drive and and uh, we came to the first little town there, and, and Jeffrey and Alana said, Dad, we need to stop. I said, for what? Water. Have you been that thirsty? So thirsty you don't want milk, you don't want a soda, you don't want tea, you don't want lemonade. When you're really thirsty, what do you want? Water. Well, guess what? The Alpha and Omega will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. How satisfying. And it's where? In heaven. Every desire that we have will be perfectly and completely satisfied once and for all. And here on earth, we may pursue happiness, for example, but we don't ever really completely find it. And unlike, unlike the severe droughts in places around the world, including Central Oregon, in heaven there is an endless supply of life-giving water. Heaven is a place of untold riches. 
I began to put some text together to support that notion, and I found that uh, John spent a considerable portion, in fact, uh, Revelation 21, verses 9 and onward, described the incredible riches of the New Jerusalem. Have you read that passage recently? Over in Ezekiel 48, there's some things about New Jerusalem as well. And we're not going to take time to read those verses this morning, but you're certainly encouraged to do so sometime. I Suffice it to say that the passage in question there in Revelation 21 describes foundations which represent permanence, Walls, which represent protection. Gates, which represent provision. And streets, which can represent praise. And the intriguing thing about it to me is that all of those, all of those are made of precious gems. <coughs> Building foundations, for example. Around here, they're building a lot of foundations. I see them. They're usually underground. When the project's finished, you don't see the foundation, or at least if you do, it's just a little bit at the top. But this foundation, John describes as visible. Not only visible, it's 12 layers thick. And each of those 12 foundations is garnished with a different jewel. They range from blue to green to white with brown streaks to blood red to yellow to purple. You'll find it there in that chapter. All of these colors represent something about the character and nature of Jesus which is a sermon for another time. I believe the primary interpretation of those foundations is permanence. You see, you can build a doghouse on dirt. You can build a storage shed on a simple slab. But if you're going to build a house, and you want it to be there a hundred years from now, let alone eternity, You'd better have a good, strong foundation. And every time we look upon those foundations, we'll be reminded of their permanence. You remember the song, which goes in part, 10,000 years, and we've just begun. In Bible times, walls were all about protection. An unwalled city was vulnerable. It was an easy target. But in heaven, the enemies of God's family will be no more. Sickness can't scale those walls. Heartache can't tunnel under them. There's no crime or perversion, nothing to harm, nothing to molest, nothing to injure, nothing to destroy, and consequently, nothing to fear. No viruses, no disease, no arthritis. I relate to that one really well. No pestilence, no public enemy number one, death. And then I have a question. Who started the stories about St. Peter standing at the gates of heaven? That's not really a biblical concept. But each of the 12 gates is guarded by an angel. And every gate, according to Revelation, is of one pearl. Now, I don't know exactly how big the gates are, 
But if you're going to have a gate even big enough for me to go through, it's going to be a big pearl. <laughs> and I imagine it's going to be a whole lot bigger than that. The gate, that is. And the pearl that goes in it. And they are a reminder of God's provision. Calvary was God's answer to man's sin. And as we walk through those gates, we'll be reminded of that fact. We cannot enter in and of ourselves. We won't be there because of all the wonderful things we've done. We'll be there because of Jesus. And he made us his pearls of great price. What a wonderful Lord we serve. The golden streets, I'll just spend a quick moment on that, are a symbol of the glory, honor, and majesty of God. That's why there's so much gold. That's why gold was used in the Old Testament temple. Won't it be great to be able to lift up the Lord in the way he deserves without the restraint of this sinful human flesh? We will be able to do that on streets of gold. Uncle Bud Robinson, known by, as uncle by everybody who is acquainted with him, he was an old tongue-tied preacher years ago, and he was often criticized for his preaching because he not only got tongue-tied, but he shouted a lot. He got happy in Jesus. And somebody asked him one day why he always praised the Lord so audibly and outwardly. And he said, I just can't help it. When my left foot hits the floor, it says hallelujah. And when my right foot hits the floor, it says praise the Lord. And so it's hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, everywhere I go. There are days, and I'm not suggesting, by the way, that you all jump up and start praising the Lord that way here this morning. But there are days when I think... We're a little staid in our public expression of how much we appreciate God. I can just imagine walking down those streets of gold in heaven saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Yes, heaven is indeed a place of riches. Then I came to a portion of the chapter which I read twice and three times. Right in the middle of all this positive, beautiful description of heaven, God gives us a list of some who won't be there. You know, we're told we shouldn't, when we're, when we're training our kids, when we're teaching them, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't say anything negative. We should always be on the positive side. And, but the Lord had reason to tell John to put a little verse in there. I asked myself, why did God choose to include the information I'm going to share? Could it be a reminder that sin, which has cursed and ultimately destroyed this world and the people in it, will not be allowed into the next? I think perhaps. 
It's quite a list, and if none of the other descriptions catch our attention, the word abominable should. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Hmm. Elsewhere in scripture, abominable is defined as those involved with astrology, mediums, fortune tellers, wizards. You'll see that in Deuteronomy 17 and 18. Homosexuality, Leviticus 18. Cheating in business, Proverbs 20. Compulsive lying, Proverbs 12. And a prideful heart, Proverbs 16. And there are many more. Heaven is off limits to all of these things. That's what this verse is saying. Don't miss this truth, however. Any person involved with these abominations can be saved And by the way, you don't have to commit an abomination to be lost. Just one sin. How so? Well, most of us have fit into one or more of these categories at some point in our lives. And some here this morning might be convicted that you are still living that way and that things are hopeless. Well, I am glad you came today if you're in that group because I've got good news for you. Such were some of you, but you were what? Washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And if I may speak to someone here today who's seeking a refuge from the temptations all around, find that refuge in Jesus, know that his grace is sufficient and that he has promised to provide complete and perfect refuge when he comes to take you home. Heaven is a place indeed of refuge and relief. And God will do what? Wipe away every tear. Isn't that going to be great? There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Really? No hospitals or graves? No aging, no wrinkles? Nothing will ruin, rot, or rust? No thirsting, nor hungering? No itching, no blindness, no deafness, no diabetes, no cancer, no heart attacks, no scars, no witchcraft, no drugs, no alcohol, no tobacco, no divorce, no child abductions, no accidents. We could go on and on. And no more bills. The story is told of a little five-year-old girl who had never before stayed the night with a friend. She was nervous, but she gave it a try. And she did fine during the daytime. But when it got dark and it was time to go to sleep in a strange place, oh my. She became so nervous that her friend's mother perceived it and asked, Honey, are you getting homesick? I love the answer. With childlike innocence, she replied, No, ma'am, 
I'm getting here sick. <laughs> and the more we get here sick on this old planet, the sweeter heaven will be. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Number seven, we're getting there. Number seven is a place where righteousness abounds. Sticky pages. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And did I go zooming past one already? Yeah. We don't need to go there. You can look it up. <laughs> and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Don't you suppose the angel measured correctly? I believe so. <laughs> Fantastic. The New Jerusalem, if you translate those verses a little bit, it's about 1,380 miles on a side. That's a long way. Travel from the tip of Maine to the southern tip of Florida over to Colorado, and then, well, I don't know where you're going for the last leg, but you're just going to go and... and Guess what? Guess what? It'll take a while. Even in heaven, I think. But what a joyous experience that would be. To go around the walls of the New Jerusalem. Either way, it's going to make New York City look like a little village. A perfect cube stands for balance and order, perfect in its materials, its majesty, even its measurements. And that perfect cube is going to be filled up with what? God himself will be there. And those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb are going to be there. A righteous God and his made righteous saints will all be there. That's a lot of rightness in one place. So when I hear people say as they look around today, it just isn't right. Well, take courage. It's going to change. And finally, last one. Heaven is a place of new and continually growing relationships. Revelation 21.3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people God himself shall be with them and be their God. Talk about a relationship. It starts here, but then we will see him face to face. And I'm believing he'll have time for a little chat with each of us. Relationships. You know, they're what, what makes heaven heaven. If the streets weren't gold, but gravel. If the walls were all particle board and not jasper. If mud was knee deep. If there were weeds growing over our heads. It would still be heaven. Because Jesus 
is there. One of the most precious experiences we'll have in heaven is being approached by someone who says, I'm here because of your witness, your testimony, your missions giving, your prayers. And can you imagine what it would be like to make the acquaintance of heroes of the faith from days long past? We'll also see the only man-made thing in heaven. You wondering what that is? As we study about all God is preparing for us, let's not forget the paralyzing sight we'll behold in the nail-scarred hands and feet of Jesus. A constant reminder of how we got there. The fire that consumes the wicked purifies the earth. Every trace of the curse is swept away. No eternally burning hell will keep before the ransom, the fearful consequences of sin, one reminder alone remains. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of his crucifixion. And upon his wounded head, upon his side, his hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. Well, there you have it. A cursory view of heaven. Which, at least for me, prompts the question, how do I get there? And the apostle answers that in Revelation 21, 27. There shall... Whoops. Yeah, there we go. There shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are what? Written in the Lamb's book of life. And how do you get your name written there? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. Put your faith and trust in him alone as your only hope for heaven. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Home. I've heard some interesting descriptions. Home is not a place. It's a feeling. What I love most about my home is who I share it with. There's nothing more important than a good, safe, secure home. Home is a place you grow up wanting to leave and grow old wanting to get back to. And if we can say that about our earthly homes, imagine what we can say about our heavenly home. I'm going to ask John and Nancy to come and they're going to sing. They're going to sing about our heavenly home. And um, I'm going to invite Nathan back there. Can you advance? Or Here, I'll give it this to Jeb. I'll give this, I want to give this to somebody. Oh, there you are, Jerry. Advance the slides as they sing. And I'm going to invite you, you'll see it on the screen, join in the song on the last chorus if you wish to. By then, you should know it reasonably well. 